In our first story, the Electricity Company of Ghana is expected to release a power outage timetable to guide consumers as gas supply to some power plants is going to be affected for the next 14 days. This is due to a shutdown of the Etiabo gas processing plant in the western region, which is expected to ensure efficiency of gas processing plants and its working. We have the latest from Martin Isiedudate. Electricity consumers in Ghana may have to brace themselves for another two weeks of power outage because the actuable gas processing plant from which we get gas to produce power is going to be shut down for maintenance works and that will last for at least two weeks. The energy ministry in a statement says that in the immediate term they are looking at importing gas from Nigeria to feed these power producing institutions. But ECG and Gridco, that is the distributor and the transmitter of power in the country, have also released a joint statement confirming the fact that the lack of supply of gas is going to have an adverse impact on power consumption in the country. In the meantime, still in the power sector though, ECG is still undergoing its revenue mobilization exercise. So if you are not getting power, there is a likelihood it might be because of the lack of gas or probably because you owe and ECG have taken your power. We've been asking the Executive Director for the Africa Centre for Energy Policy, ASAP, Ben Boache, about why the current um, announcement has been made. We also do know that the Great Coast Statement, are letting of a possible load shedding, is one expected for the type of power supply we have as it is. Uh, you know, mechanical system. You have to maintain it uh, periodically. And Ghana Gas would have its own shadow on how to do major uh, maintenance and when to do minor maintenance, which may require a shutdown of the plant. So it's not anything unexpected. Um, they should have expected that they were going to shut down and plan uh, adequately for it. And I think it's been recurrent. Uh, anytime they have a maintenance shutdown, we have to uh, shed load uh, to be able to accommodate uh, the shutdown. It clearly tells you that you know there is some room for improvement in planning our power system. Um, right from the time when we exited uh, generation shortage, uh, fuel supply periodically becomes an issue uh, because we are not planning uh, well enough to be able to offset uh, some of these uh, challenges. Interestingly, we have a power system that should be able uh, to address these kinds of problems. Uh, for example, we have dual fuel plants uh, in Abuazi that can take, you know, like crude oil if you don't have gas uh, to run them. The fundamental question is where are they? Where are those plants? And why are there, are there not uh, enough crude oil to be able to uh, turn those turbines on? to forestall you know, this um, load shedding that is being imposed on the consumer. And it's almost as if, on a permanent basis, uh, a consumer that need not care about when a power plant will go on or off, is always being informed about how gas system works, how the power generation system works, how the transmission system works. But that is none of the business of the consumer. All the consumer wants is a stable supply of power and let them focus on doing what they do best, support the economy. The media is supposed to focus on doing its media work. Those printing need to focus on doing their printing. Those doing hotel business should focus on their hotel business. They shouldn't add power system challenges uh, to their uh, uh, problems. But that is what we have said. Mm -hmm. Certainly, it will have impact uh, on businesses. I haven't been privy to how the segmentation of the low shedding is going to be like. I hope it doesn't affect uh, big industries that need not shut down or it may cost significant cost to them uh, if they shut down and restart their businesses. Uh, you know, there are some production processes when you restart, you lose so much money. Um, and I hope that they'll be able to segment those and keep them uh, on the grid. Um, where it's, it's going to, there's going to be economic loss. 
away from electricity. The anti-LGBTQ plus bill has moved one step closer to law after the Constitutional, Legal and Parliamentary Affairs Committee in Parliament recommended its passage. Judith Awakitsando has more. It was all quiet on the promotion of the proper human sexual rights and Ghanaian Family Values Bill until U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris came into town this week. A great deal of, of work in my career has been to address human rights issues, equality issues across the board, including as it relates to the LGBT community. And I feel very strongly about the importance of supporting uh, the, the, the freedom and, and supporting and fighting for equality among all people. That comment and the response by the president, Nane Kufadu, that suggested the bill had been watered down, has since triggered a reaction from Speaker of Parliament, Alban Babin. The bill will be passed. This is the word to His Excellency the President. There is no way he can intervene. That answer he gave, that is now before Parliament. And when he gets to a stage, that he has to, he will come, in. hey, please. This is legislation, this is not execution. And now, after the Speaker dared the legal committee to not be afraid and present its recommendation on the draft bill, they have acted. After a review of the draft bill, the legal committee has recommended some changes to the bill in an 18-page document that is now due for consideration by the entire floor of the House. The bill will punish teaching or inducing a child into sexual acts other than what it calls the binary category of male or female or anyone who evokes the interests of the child in an activity prohibited under the act to not less than six years in prison and not more than 10 years in prison. The name of the bill has changed from promotion of proper human sexual rights and Ghanaian family values to human sexual rights and family values bill. Ranking member on the Constitutional, Legal and Parliamentary Affairs Committee, Bernard Ahiafo, says the committee is determined to see through the passage of the bill. We are looking at the bill in that context, taking into account our culture practices, our religious practices as enshrined in the 1992 Constitution. So I assure everybody that will make sure the bill will come into law in a manner such that it will achieve its purpose and at the same time will not trample upon anybody's right. It remains to be seen how much of external pressure that the country can resist though. Already, President Tikufado's non-committal response on the subject during the press conference with the U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris has drawn criticism from the backers of the bill. President of the Catholic Bishops' Conference, Most Reverend Matthew Jimfi, is quoted by the Catholic Trends website as saying the president should have been more upfront in that briefing. He said, quote, We expect our president to have spoken more boldly to say what the people of Ghana at least have said up till now. Unquote. Those vehemently opposed to the bill will disagree. It leaves President de Kufado since the intense, often divisive debate on the bill began. Judith Awachetando, TV3 News. Now, the ranking member of the Constitutional, Legal and Parliamentary Affairs Committee, a member of parliament for Akachi South, Bernard Anyafo, is hopeful the bill will be passed into law. Speaking to Portia Gabo on News 360, he noted that both sides of the House have reached consensus on the bill and that the amendment from the committee was only to ensure that no room is left to be manipulated. In fact, the committee has done its work. The report of the committee is ready. It's been laid on the floor of Parliament. It is now left to the business committee to program the second reading of the bill and surely it will be passed into law. I must state that Parliament is unanimous. Both sides uh, have agreed, in a way, that this is a bill that must be passed into law. And I look forward to seeing that the bill is actually passed into law. Uh, the Committee on Constitutional, Legal and Parliamentary Affairs is made up of eminent lawyers, very senior ones for that matter. So in passing a bill into law, we look at the existing laws of the country, and we also look at the Constitution of the Republic of Ghana. And since this is a bill that, in a way, borders on fundamental human rights, Article 12 and Chapter 12 
of the 1992 Constitution was dedicated to fundamental human rights. So we look at the provisions in the Constitution and ensure that no provisions in the bill is contrary to the provisions in the 1992 Constitution. Because as lawyers, we know that if Parliament passed a law which is in contravention with the Constitution to the extent of its inconsistency or contravention, it is null and void. So the committee members wouldn't want to pass any law which will contradict the provisions of the Constitution and the existing laws. Okay. For that matter, uh, we look at the Criminal and Other Offenses Act, particularly Section 104, realize that it proscribes a natural canal knowledge and there is a punishment for the unnatural canal knowledge. And while the member of parliament for North Tong, Samuel Okujetua Blackwa, says the latest revelation is a slap in the face of several calls for government to cut down on its expenditure as a means to manage a broken economy. And this is in regard to a statement issued by the presidency about the number of appointed uh, individuals at the presidency. He told Alfredo Kansi on Ghana tonight, the president is simply insensitive and must be called to order. I have come to the firm conclusion that this country is in big trouble. We have a leader who doesn't listen, who has become so obstinate, so intransigent, so stony hearted. He is impervious to good counsel. When you go through the latest report, which is the 2022 list, of staffers at the presidency in compliance with the Presidential Office Act. It is totally incredible that at this time of the worst economic crisis in living memory, at a time that haircuts are taking place, financial haircuts, the first time in our history we are going through a debt restructuring program, the first time in our history that we have not been able to pay our loans. We have defaulted in the payment of our loan obligations. The first time that we as a country have been downgraded by all the credit rating agencies from Fitch to Standard & Poor's to Moody's. At a time that everybody, civil society, the political parties, even for the first time, diplomats have entered the arena. And for good reason. They are saying you have come to us for debt restructuring, for debt forgiveness. We expect you to lead by example, be responsible, and reduce the size of your government. As the German ambassador told the president recently, in the midst of all of this, I mean, who would have imagined that President Akufuado will increase the numbers at the presidency. Now, the bloated number of presidential staffers is contained in a latest document submitted to Parliament by the presidency, which is said to be incurring the wrath of governance watchers and campaigners. The document captures at least 1,048 staffers who work at the presidency, serving various administrative and domestic roles. In addition to political appointees at the office of the president, employees of various public sector organizations assigned to the office were also included in the document. These categories of staff were from different classes, including administrative, executive or clerical records, secretarial budget, procurement, and supply chain management. The rest of staff at the presidency are from the presidential household and staff from the Department of Parks and Gardens, the Ghana Health Service, Controller and Accountant General's Department, among others. There are also staff at the Ghana Audit Service, the Ghana National Fire Service, Public Works Department, and the Ghana Postal Company. It comes at a time that there is excessive pressure on government to cut down its size as Ghana goes cap in hand with its multilateral donor seeking an IMF bailout as the economy witnesses a meltdown.
In other news, the management of the Investor of Ghana has described as misleading claims by some members of parliament that the institution has disregarded a court order seeking it to halt its new residential policy. In a statement, the investor indicates that the new residential policy was implemented even before the order of injunction and that the allocation of rooms to fresh students assigned to the Commonwealth Hall ceased immediately the court injunction was made. The University of Ghana was directed by an Accra High Court to halt a new residential policy which removed continuing male students of the Commonwealth and Mensa Summer Halls. Through its lawyers, the school appealed the court directive, but affected students and some alumni of the halls are not satisfied with the school's posture. A former resident of the Commonwealth Hall and MP for Bursa South, Clement Apak, on Wednesday told Parliament the refusal of the university to comply with the court directive is unacceptable and illegal. The management of the University of Ghana have refused to act in accordance with the dictates of the order. The police and other allied security personnel have been employed by the management of the University of Ghana to frustrate the efforts being made by the students to call attention to the management of the university to obey the order of the court and to reinstate them. But the university has faulted some assertions the lawmaker made. According to management, no court directive has been violated, adding that the new residential policy was implemented even before the order of injunction. Meanwhile, First Deputy Speaker of Parliament, Joseph Osewusu, has tasked the Education Committee of Parliament to investigate the matter. I will refer this statement to the Committee of Education to ask them to engage the university and to report back to us why the university authority headed by the immediate part chief justice she is the chairman of the university council so we expect that she would ensure that the law and order respect for the courts are the sanctity of the court orders are respected christian yale tv3 news accra And Trust TV3 News will bring you the latest happenings on the campus of the University of Ghana. Now, let's take you elsewhere on the continent, where a leading Senegalese opposition leader, Osman Sonko, has been found guilty of libel and handed a two-month suspended jail sentence. Mr. Sonko was charged with libel after accusing the country's tourism minister, Mame Mbaye Nyang, of embezzlement. Protests broke out across the capital, Dakar, ahead of the trial. Sonko's lawyers say the sentence is not expected to prevent him from running in presidential elections taking place in 2024. He had previously denied the charges and said they were a tactic to eliminate him from the race. And that's the latest of news highlights on TV3 New Day. Make sure you get all the latest news updates on 3news.com as well as on our socials as you go search for TV3 Ghana. Well, we have next the latest as far as uh, climax of Ghana month with excessive history as well as dance, culture, dishes and all that the Volta region is made of for this morning's package. Do stay with us.